This is EHJ Today and I'm Tom Lusher, Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal and I'm sitting here in the studio in Davos at the Cardiology Update uh, speaking with uh, Scott Solomon who is Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology at the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Welcome Scott. Thank you Tom. So uh, beyond the ejection fraction we're talking about heart failure and there, of course, uh, ejection fraction is the first thing we consider when we look at the risk of a patient. Is this appropriate uh, or is it not? Well, uh, as you know, ejection fraction is the single uh, most asked for number metric that we have to assess patients with heart failure or with any kind of cardiovascular disease, actually. And I, I'm an echocardiographer. I sit in the echo lab all day long and I get calls all day long, what was the ejection fraction? And then I, I tell them and I say, do you want to know anything else? Uh, because this is only one unidimensional part of the picture. And uh, I think we need to move beyond this for a number of reasons. First, it only uh, quantifies risk uh, in a, a small degree. We have so many other things that we know about the patients that help us quantify risk. For example, how old they are, whether they have diabetes, their renal function. That completely changes the relationship between their ejection fraction and their outcomes. And we've shown that in, uh, for example, in patients with diabetes, that an individual who has uh, diabetes and has an ejection fraction of 40%, behaves exactly like somebody without diabetes who has an injection fraction of 25%. So that's 15 points. The same thing for patients with renal dysfunction. So although the guidelines will use ejection fraction as a criteria for deciding who do we put an ICD in, I can show you data from many studies, CHARM, Valiant, that patients with renal dysfunction, patients with diabetes, who have higher ejection fractions than the cutoff are at the same risk of sudden death as somebody with an ejection fraction that's, say, below uh, 35%, but doesn't have these other comorbidities. So comorbidities matter. The other question I have is a bit more radical. I just, we just had some sessions on valvular heart disease. And what does ejection fraction mean in a patient with heart failure that has, uh, has mitral regurgitation? Uh, mitral regurgitation, as you know, uh, is a way of unloading the heart. Uh, the blood, of course, is going backwards. You can get an artificially increased ejection fraction in that setting. And so an ejection fraction of 55 or 60 percent, which we might call normal in somebody without mitral regurgitation, uh, could be actually uh, uh, in a patient with some degree of myocardial dysfunction if they also have severe mitral regurgitation. So we have to be very careful. Um, mitral regurgitation itself is a risk factor. So what we advocate doing is taking into account a number of metrics, ejection fraction, uh, other measures of cardiac performance, including uh, right ventricular function. Uh, mitral regurgitation is important. Left atrial size is important. Left ventricular mass is important. We've looked at now all of these, if you put them together, you get a much better predictive uh, ability to prognosticate about what is going to happen to that patient than just looking at ejection fraction. What we actually want to know when we talk about ejection fraction is the performance of the yes. muscle of the left ventricle primarily. Are there other means than ejection fraction, like the, the more advanced technologies in ECHO, uh, to, to get a glimpse in, in how good the myocardium actually contracts? Yeah, there are. Some have been around for a while, so you can use the myocardial performance index, which is a measure that takes into account the isovolumic contraction and relaxation time divided by the ejection frame. It's an old method. It's similar to the systolic time intervals that we yeah. used many years ago, um, but it works. Most people don't actually use it. Um, what I'm most excited about these days are some of the measures that use uh, speckle tracking yes. to assess myocardial strain. Mm -hmm. And this uses the coherent speckle that is present within the myocardium on these echocardiograms to basically track the endocardium. And through that, we can get an, uh, an actual strain measurement 
The one that has become, uh, I think, most important is global longitudinal strain, which is a measure of the longitudinal uh, function of the heart. And what we've seen is that this longitudinal function of the heart appears to worsen in the setting of hypertension and in the setting of heart failure. Um, it's one of the earliest things to go, even before you start to lose any, uh, any evidence of ejection fraction. In fact, ejection fraction can be going up as a way to compensate for the loss of longitudinal function. In our hands, in a particularly in hypertension, particularly in hypertension and, and in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, in our hands, this has been the single best predictor of outcome in several heart failure cohorts, including patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but also in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where EF is simply not a good metric at all. Yes. So if we have this number, and if it's low, then usually we know according to the guidelines what to do. What do we do in this half path guys and the patients that have a preserved ejection fraction, yet they have symptoms, and you have to do something about it? Yeah, and, and it's a great question, and it's been problematic. So what do we call half path Well, um, there's some debate over what that number should be. We know heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a cutoff of 40%. There's nothing magical about these cutoffs because EF is a plus or minus seven number anyway. We typically use over 40, 45% or over to define heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And um, once you get into that range, EF isn't really that useful as a, as a measure of risk. What is in these patients? Well, um, uh, longitudinal strain turns out to be a very good measure. In the TopCat study, and these are data that are uh, not yet published, uh, longitudinal strain is the single best predictor of outcome uh, in these patients. Uh, left atrial size is a very good predictor of outcome in patients with HEFPEF. So again, looking at the whole heart, not just the, uh, uh, this one number, is a much better uh, metric and measure of, of, of risk in these patients. What we also observed in our own database is that with age, if you don't have half ref, the reduced ejection fraction, your heart gets smaller, ejection fraction actually increases, and atrial size increases too. So is this longitudinal uh, change of strain, is this uh, the explanation why ejection fraction increases with age, or could it? What we, what we think is happening is that um, with aging, Longitudinal function worsens first, and these are the, mostly based on the subendocardial uh, fibers. Mm -hmm. But in compensation for that, circumferential function actually improves. Okay. And so ejection fraction can go up in that first um, uh, wave in, in, uh, as people age. But what we've also seen is that as people progress from hypertension and aging, and not everybody does this, of course, to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, circumferential function starts to decline. And I'm not uh, sure that what we're not seeing is people who are going up this curve where circumferential function is getting better initially as a compensation, but then getting worse as the disease progresses. And ultimately, what we've seen in the HEFPEF populations we've studied is a reduction not just of longitudinal function, but also of circumferential function. Well, that's very interesting, and so really we have to look at the entire heart, and then also at the entire patient to reach uh, appropriate decisions. Thank you very much, Scott, for this uh, interview.